called sun. The sun has hit his life's rock bottom. He is at the end of himself. He has, he has hit his lowest point. Here he is, the son of a rich man, but he's feeding pigs for a stranger in a foreign land. Now, he was a Jew, so being around pigs would make him unclean, even if he wanted to go to the temple. He couldn't go to the temple. He was totally cut off from his culture, from his family. So how has he got to this point? Now, I have prepared some slides, but I'm having a technical breakdown. Mm -hmm. I drove halfway here this afternoon, and I realised, ah, I've got no keys. <laughs> so Dean came to the rescue, and um, yeah, I, uh, I can't get the slides to work on the computer. So forgive me. There's normally some great slides behind me. <laughs> so the first point, how has he got here? Well, I would put to you that... He is part of a society breakdown. You see, Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger one said to his father, give me my share of the estate. So the man divided his property between them. Verse 18, that is. Sorry, verse 11. The younger son here is asking his father the unthinkable thing. He would be in line to get a part of the, his inheritance anyway. But basically, what he's doing is saying, Dad, I wish you were dead. And in Jewish law, by rights, he should have been dragged for disrespecting his father and mother. He should have been dragged to the, the, the square of the, um, of the village and stoned to death. Clearly, not a nice way to die. But that was the law. And it should provide a powerful deterrent to stop that happening. But clearly, something is wrong here. And I would put to you that in that family unit, there has been some society breakdown. A lack of respect for the father. A lack of respect for the mother. Something has gone wrong there. But you see, it goes on to say... Not long after that, the son got everything together he had. His father had said, okay, I'll give you what you want. Here's the money. And not content with just the money, he puts a vast dif uh, distance between them. And he spends his money in reckless living and squanders his wealth. The son puts many miles between himself and his family. So, I would put to you, perhaps there's some pain here, something that's gone on, something that makes this boy want to get away from his father and his family. The story, however, the account, however, suggests that the son wanted to please himself and do as he pleased with no concern for his father or his family. As the story clearly testifies, the father still loves the son. But, sadly, this love is not returned back to the father. So I would say to you, as well as there being a society breakdown, there is a relationship breakdown here. Let's look at verse uh, 16. I'm, not, I'm trying not to wear my glasses because I realise I look like a headmaster taking them all off and on again. And that's not, not, not to be rude, David. I know, you, I know you were a headmaster. <laughs> Verse 16 says, uh, he, And after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country. And when he began to be in need, he went and hired himself <clears throat> out to a citizen of that country who sent him out into the field to feed his this man has gone from being a son and an heir to being a foreigner in a strange land to now being a servant of a foreigner, feeding the animals that would make him unclean. He wouldn't be able to associate with other Jews. 
Here is a man who has fallen just about as far down the ladder as he could possibly go. I would say there was no further rungs to be had. And when he came to his senses, he said to himself, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here am I starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And so he got up and went to his father. He has come to his senses. He has had a moment of clarity. And he goes back to see the father. And the father is looking there, looking on the horizon. And as we heard last weekend, he, was, he didn't take a copy break. He didn't take a break to go and do something else. He was there constantly looking for this son. Notice the three, this, this couple of things that the father gives the son. <clears throat> the father's welcomed him back. And the, the, the son has gone through his well-rehearsed line. Father, I've sinned against you and against heaven. Father, make me work like one of your hired servants. I'm no longer worthy. And the father ignores all of that. The father says, come, br quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Clue number one, there's a robe. Number two, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine who was dead is alive again. He was lost and, they were and, and is now found. And so they began to celebrate. Notice, first of all, that... These things were all ready, waiting for the son. He didn't have to say, quick, go down the tailors and get a robe made. Quick, go to the jewellers and, and buy a ring. Go to the shoe shop and buy shoes. They were already there. The father was in anticipation, waiting for the son to come back. Let's have a look at these, these things that the father had prepared. The robe. What do you think of when I say a robe? What, 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 what's the first thing that comes into your mind? Royalty. Royalty. What, sorry? Royalty. Royalty. Fantastic. Thank you, sir. Royalty. I exa I'm exactly the same. When I think of it, I cast my mind back to that day, a couple of months ago, when Prince Charles became King Charles. So, the king, the king is there with his robe on, and it's not just any old robe. Some of these robes have got official names, Latin names. Some of these robes are really, really old. They're all very expensive. And um, we, we were sitting with, with one of our friends from, from Grangetown, and she knew all the names of all the robes and the significance of this and that. It was really interesting. I don't remember any of it, but it was really interesting. <laughs> <clears throat> so, the coronation robes have a significance but you see <coughs> even if I put them on that wouldn't make me the king it wouldn't go oh here's King Ian <laughs> you see to wear the robe you have to have a relationship with somebody Charles was Elizabeth's daughter yeah. Simon. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just a technical breakdown today. Charles was the son. And there was a relationship there. Charles couldn't become the king if he wasn't her son. Andrew can't become the king. For lots of reasons. But, but you, you hear what I'm saying? There is relationship, there is precedent, and that is, is why Charles got the crown. He was her oldest son, and he became the king on her death. And I think this is what the father in the story was saying. 
You see, the son has acknowledged that he has sinned and is no longer worthy to be called his son. But the father says, no, you are my son. Put the robe on. We have relationship. Society is restored here. And you might be thinking here this afternoon that you've done things that have put a barrier between you and God. And like the son, you might feel that you're no longer worthy to even consider having a relationship with God the Father. However, good news, God the Father has a robe waiting for you today. He wants to restore the relationship that you once had with him before sin came into our lives. The robe restores the relationship with God the Father. Let's think about the second thing, the, the ring. You see, the father, this father in the story, he's not finished there. He could have said, just put a robe on him, we're, we're, everything's fine, but no. Let's think about a ring. What are they made of? Generally, gold, platinum, silver, precious metals. They are a symbol of love. Popular culture would tell us that if you like it, you should put a ring on it. <laughs> but God doesn't say that. God says he loves you. He doesn't just like you, he loves you. And he would put a ring on your finger. God the Father says you are precious to him. Let's think about a ring again. A ring has no start and no end. There is no beginning. It is an eternal loop. And this is God's eternal love for you. It doesn't, it doesn't start or stop at any point. It is eternal. God has loved you from the world's beginning. And you see, the father has put this ring on this son's finger and his status is elevated further. It's lifted further. You see, he has been restored into a right relationship with the father. He is his son. And then there's a ring and it's put on his finger. And you might be sitting here this afternoon thinking, well, you know, that's all well and good, Ian, but nobody loves me. Or you might feel that you're unworthy of love. That's just not true. In the kingdom of heaven, God the Father says he wants to re reunite in relationship with you, that he loves you. He says he's put a robe on you and a ring on your finger because you are the child that he loves. And the Father goes further in the story. He says, put some sandals on this man's feet. Now, sandals wouldn't be worn by the servants, they would be reserved for the, the better people. And although the son has said, Father, make me a servant, the father says, that's not good enough for you. I want you to not be a servant. I want you to be my son. The son was so cast down that he realized <laughs> that although he wanted a relationship with his father and to get to that situation, he was prepared to put himself into servitude, into slavery to his father. And again, you might be sitting here feeling like that wasteful son, that you are miles from the father, and you are living in slavery to something. And you realise, like the son, feeding the pigs, there is no satisfaction. The son was hungry feeding the pigs. Although he had food, it wasn't food that he could eat. He was hungry. And the things that we live in slavery to in this world are many. Maybe, like the sun, you like to party. Or like so many in this world, you're a slave to an addiction. Or you're a slave to money, or possessions, or work. Maybe, this afternoon, you want to come back to the Father, but you feel held back by some slavery to sin. And God the Father would say to us today that you are no longer a slave or a servant. Put sandals on their feet. Mm -hmm. He wants you to live a life free from the things that would pull you back. Mm -hmm. So there are three things there. 
but there's also a fourth. The reality is there is a cost. Look at verse, I think it's 18. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I cut some words out there, but the father says, bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. The father's generosity comes at a cost. And it is right that he is pleased to receive his son back home. And it is right that he demonstrates his love for him. And it is right that he releases him from the servanthood that the son was prepared to put himself in. But something has to pay a price. And in the story, it's a fattened calf. The calf pays the price for that celebration. But what about us today? Who pays the price for us to be reunited to God? Who pays the price for God to show his love for us? For God to release us from sin? You see, God the Father sent his only son, Jesus, to die for us in payment for our sins. And he loves us so much, he did this to make right all the wrong things that I've done and that you have done. And so, as I close this afternoon, I have to ask you, this afternoon, if you don't know Jesus, will you accept that role and come back into right relationship with God? Will you allow him to put a ring on your finger and accept his love? Will you take those sandals on your feet that mean you're no longer a servant, that you are a son of the living God, a daughter of the living God? Will you take part in the celebration feast? Will you acknowledge the cost of this? And today, will we accept that God longs for us to return to him? To have a relationship with him that he longs to call you son or daughter and for you to call him father will you allow him to set you free from slavery and sin will you accept the lord jesus christ as your savior today and one last question will you today turn the reading into a prayer let's just close our eyes if anything that i've said has made sense has triggered something in you has made you realize that you need a relationship with the father just say this prayer out we're all going to say it anyway but just just come along with me so repeat after me heavenly father I know I have sinned against heaven and against you. I know I have sinned against heaven and against you. I know that in my own standing I am no longer worthy to be called a son or daughter. I know that in my own standing I am no longer worthy to be called a son or a daughter. But through the life, through the death and resurrection of your son Jesus. But through the death and resurrection of your Son Jesus, I can come into relationship with you. I can come into relationship with you. I am a child of God, no longer, and no longer living in slavery to sin. And no longer living in slavery to sin. Thank you, Lord, for my freedom bought at so great a cost. Thank you, Lord, for my freedom bought at so great a cost. Thank you. Now, if you have prayed that prayer today or you want prayer, we've got a corner over there where we'll, somebody would love to meet you. Um, we'll, we're more than happy to pray and just chat with you at the end. Um, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to hand over to Owen, who's going to lead us in communion.